out and we're thankful that you've all joined and came along and shared our experience. And I'd like to welcome Cheryl to the floor. Cheryl Gotham is the A panelist from UFORQ. <laughs>
in 1992, it was a woman called Rita Hayden. And Rita actually became president of the Ipswich UFO Group. She had an incredible experience um, where this is the side of her house down here, so the roads are really driving down there, right? She had this experience one night, she was working for RACQ at the time, and she was driving home at 2 a.m. And um, she saw this light off in the distance. And she was following it, watching it, and then it disappeared. And the next thing she knows, this thing is beside the car, right beside the car. I'm talking, put your arm out the window, she could have touched it, right? And it was, um, it was silver, it was smooth and sleek. No joints, no rivets, no nothing. It's just like that with the light on the end there. Was it light or dark? So it's silver. Um, um, silver from memory, yeah, that's all I can remember saying. Um, but it was shiny, she said, very sleek and shiny. A bit like Terminator, her description mm -hmm. reminded me of that, that guy in the, yeah, yeah. the Terminator show. Um, anyway, she was, um, and then it, uh, there was a, a railway line, a railway line, the boom, deck, boom gate um, would come down, the red light. Uh, there was a car pulled up in front of her, she pulled up behind it and this thing left. Right? But then she drove off and thought, where the heck did that go? Not, not really the whole event sinking in really, when you think about that just outside the window. Right? Um, she goes to turn into her street and as she's driving down, she sees it hovering over a neighbor's garage. So she, then she pull, gets down in her driveway and thinks, well, I want to get into my house, <laughs> but I've got to drive in. So she drove in, raced out of the car, through the um, door, and uh, went inside and called us. And she spoke to my husband at the time, she was on the phone for quite a while, and it turned out that the object moved from over the neighbour's garage to over her backyard, and it was there for an hour, and it lit up the place as bright as day. Now that brightest day, like the sun's out in the evening, I heard that, I can't tell you how many times I've heard that through the 90s, and still do, right? And it might be a green, like a green sun. People say it's a huge green light. So that's very common. Um, and it hovered there, and then, it, um, and then it took off. But it was there for an hour, and she's just watching it through the blinds. So, um, I didn't actually go out afterwards, but what my husband did, but what turned out was that uh, the little dog, the neighbour's dog, was yapping at it. Well, within a month it lost its hair and died. The mango tree that the object was hovering over, it died off. And the very next day, a foot of water was missing from her swimming pool. And that's not uncommon. So that was a very good report. I mean, I can only guess what might have happened to Rita. I don't know, you know, knowing what we know today about those sorts of events, okay? Who knows what can happen? But this was one that we sort of, in, uh, um, our organisation had in the records. And I wanted to talk to you about this because of the significance of this report. Because this was, um, it was a, a young um, couple, boyfriend, girlfriend, who were taking photos um, I believe it was um, the new car, I think. And um, anyway, they saw this object in the sky of the West End in Brisbane, which is the inner city suburbs of Brisbane. And um, it's a very strange thing because it actually, oops, actually looks like at the top of my mother's 1970s sugar bowl. So, but that's what it struck me as to start with. But what happened was, you see a lot of these, um, these sort of photos. What happened was the a photograph of it was sent to be analysed and they found that the shadows didn't line up with the time of day that they said. Next, um, the guy got such a, a hard time from the media, because it made its way to the media, that he eventually left and moved to Sydney. And he was offered payment for, you know, to fess up that it was actually a con. <laughs> And he, he said it wasn't a kind, and he never took any money, and that's when he went to go to Sydney. So, but this was 1967, right? Um, and in those days, we were just, we didn't know about missing time. We didn't know about missing time. 
So even though they took the photos, they could have had missing time, you know, as opposed to when they thought it was they actually took it. Yeah, sure. Right? Um, so I've always sort of thought that was significant because it may have been one of our very first cases of missing time. But one of our members um, went and door knocked the whole neighbourhood at the time and he only found one person who actually saw it in an eight-year-old boy. So, you know, maybe they say. But um, at the time, our president just said, no, nah, it was a con, that's it, you won't know any more about it. But, you know, I, when I came along later and looked at the report, I thought, well, it could have been some time, you just don't know. But anyway, I thought it was interesting. This was another very interesting one. Uh, I, I didn't actually investigate this. The woman rang and spoke to me on the phone, and then I um, passed her on to one of our, our rep on the Gold Coast, Peter Matic, and his wife, Cheryl. So, um, she was a manager of Admiral North Towers. I don't even know if it still exists these days. It was in 1993. It was in the evening. And she was actually out the back washing, or at, yeah, out the back um, washing the towels, and she, she was hanging them on the line. And she turned around and saw this object above her, which was about 20 feet in diameter and 8 feet high. And it had windows around the middle with yellow lights emanating, or, or emanating light. The windows were emanating yellow light. And she said it was as close as if I'd put a broom up, I could have touched it. But it was dead silent. So she raced inside. <coughs> And it hung around for an hour. And at one stage, 15 minutes, it flashed disco lights in the bedroom. She was on the bed looking out the window like this, she said. Very interesting. <laughs> because we're looking at physics here that goes beyond the range of our normal physics, isn't it? No sound, something very heavy hanging in the sky like that. How the hell does it do it? And this is another one. This is where it gets even a bit more interesting. <clears throat> This occurred in uh, at the Jack Evans Boat Harbour at the time. So they're standing outside, this guy and his friend, outside the Twin Towns RSL, having a cigarette in the evening. And they see this thing off in the distance. And they're watching it, and it comes in, and it just slices through the air just under the clouds. And it stops within 50 metres of them. And it hovers about 7 to 10 feet above the water. And it just sits there and they're watching it. And you can see the size of it in relation to the buildings here. And I wanted to read you his description. My mate and I were stunned and almost speechless as this thing, this UFO, came all the way up to us within just 50 metres and only 10 metres, sorry, I said feet before, 10 metres above the water surface of the boat harbour as it slightly slid by our very eyes to fly straight through all the high-rise buildings on Green Mount. It flew, he said to me, uh, it flew through, cut through the, he said, cut through the buildings like butter, as if they weren't there. So this is the sort of technology that we're looking at here, you know, very advanced technology. Um, he said it was as black as the ace of spades, inside and out, and he said somewhere else that it was like looking at Coca-Cola in a glass bottle. It was also transparent as it has an inside-outside appearance, much like that of a see-through jellyfish, and yet it's solid and takes its colours from within its own structure. He said it's like the fluorescent creatures of the deep, like an octopus that can change its cloak. This happened in sometime in the 90s, I can't quite clearly remember when, but it was Cedar Creek Falls in uh, Mount Tambourine, and it was a young woman and a friend, and they had taken the day off from work, and it was a drizzly day, though, but they still went up to Cedar Creek Falls. As they were approaching one of the, uh, the ponds there, um, they saw these people, four people, two men, two women, very attractive, brown hair, maybe 30s, early 30s, and they were frolicking in the water, and they were ripping their clothes off so they were naked. And um, the girls, said they, when they you know, were watching them, they said they were behaving as if it was the very first time they'd done it. And just, so they hid behind the rocks 
And I imagined their intuition was like, hmm, something strange going on here. And one of the men had a, a necklace, um, you know, um, some sort of amulet hanging down his, um, around his throat. And it was a, a blue, and it was the same colour as his eyes, which he described as beautiful blue. And um, anyway, at one stage, he looked over, caught her eye, and when he looked at her, that their eyes made contact, the amulet glow. They were out of their <laughs> flat, <laughs> you can imagine. So when they when they when she got home that night, um, she was sitting there and there was a window like this, and she was sitting here watching the television like this, and she saw the shadow of four heads through the window in the bush outside, and she got this telepathic mess message saying, we saw you at the falls today. She had a whole lot of other paranormal experiences as well. One was when she was driving along with a flatmate one night and um, she said the car is driving itself and he says, what do you mean? She says, it's not, you know, sort of um, responding to me, to me touching the steering wheel. And um, anyway, she let go of the wheel and it's just dry, like she's dr controlling it like this. Another time there were small um, orbs of light in the bedroom, in the, sorry, in the lounge room I think it was, uh, just flowing, just flying around in the air. We've heard that before too from people. And of course we have, uh, I just wanted to throw this in because you may not be aware that we have, do have a good collection of Australian circles, not just the crop circles in the UK. And this was a grass circle that was found up at uh, Conondale. In 2004, I think two years later, repeated again in 2006. Um, I just thought I'd throw this one in too, because again, it's a, it's a ground trace of um, something that's been there. And it was, you know, pretty sure it was a UFO because someone actually saw a silver cross. It was floating on the lagoon there, so it was a horseshoe lagoon. If you don't know the full story. Uh, was it was reeds that were spun around like this and they were compressed and then they floated up to the surface and you could actually um, they actually um, were cut off, pulled out from the base of the lagoon and you could swim underneath the floating pad of reeds and you could also sit on it or hold your body. 1966 again there are a lot of circles in that time. So you've got to start to wonder what was going on then, you know the, in the 60s, we had a, um, a lot of, um, in the Queensland area, there was a lot going on, a lot of ground traces were found, um, and they were found in other areas as well. But this is where it sort of starts to get a bit more interesting. And this was reported by a, um, a senior policeman in the Queensland Police Force. Uh, it occurred in 1988, which didn't hear about it until um, about 1990. And he was at Yala, and he and his brother had a, a mine there. And they were down in the mine one time, and they came up and they thought, gee, a lot of time's moved on. You know, like we expected the sun to be here and it's been there. So they sort of thought, well, that's a bit strange. But later that evening, because um, they were camping in an area where there, it was a camping area, but there were just, um, there were some toilets and showers, shower block. And um, they went to the toilet and uh, one of the brothers was in there and the other one was sort of standing outside waiting. And that's the senior policeman. And he saw this very large, you can see it's 230 metres in diameter, huge thing, huge, um, in the sky. Oh, actually it came to his attention because he was looking down like this and suddenly the moonlight disappeared. He saw he could see this shadow sort of going over like he looks up and here's this thing. Uh, and these are all the other little, uh, I guess, uh, scout ships, little spaceships anyway, some sort of craft. Um, he was convinced it was actually a craft and it was, if you knocked on it, you could touch it because later on he had a memory of actually being inside and looking down. But he was convinced it was um, hard, hard to, uh, an actual craft of some sort, uh, and not a living entity as you know some of them could be. So that was a huge sighting that they had, and they had missing time. And then they also had one night they were in the they were sleeping in a small hut, and this being uh, was communicating telepathically with the senior policeman, and and he, the policeman was saying. Um, 
I, show yourself. I want to see you. And the message was, no, you'll be too frightened. Um, and he, eventually he, he demanded that this thing show itself. And it came out into the light a little bit. And I should have thrown the, the sketching, but it was actually like a, a praying mantis. But it was just a little bit that came out into mm -hmm. the light. We have we heard a few reports of those in the 90s as well. Don't get those these days. And this was one in 1977 when it occurred. Uh, I spoke to the gentleman involved um, in sometime in the late 90s, I think it was. And they were in uh, New Zealand at a holiday place. And the two boys uh, were sitting on the beach looking out over to the horizon. It's all these two lights uh, that disappeared. Like there's one up there and one up there. The next thing they know, they're standing there and they both, this blue light encompasses them, and they both turn around to each other at the same time and say, you're all blue, like this, exactly the same time. The next memory that the main witness, uh, the witness has is of running, 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 running on the beach. And then he's looking for his friend, looking for his friend while he's running, he's panting, and then one time he looks around and his friend's beside him running, 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 running. And they run all the way home and tell the mother, and the mother says, you know, um, just go to bed, go to bed, whatever. The next day she's talking to the neighbour, and the neighbor, she's saying, oh, well, the person's saying next door anyway, saying, I couldn't get the kids to settle last night, you know, all these things that happened, they were talking about all these stories. And she said, oh, funny you should say that, because it was on the radio that they're actually being here with their reports. Now this is a very interesting case because it might change your understanding or your perception of contact or if we think we're not contacted, okay? Now this was a story told to me by a woman who rang me three times and I spent hours on the phone with her. She was um, getting on in years and she had gone to Loret de Mar in Spain and with her daughter for a holiday in the 70s. And as she's, uh, she wasn't with the daughter at the time, but they used to go down to the beach and at night at sunset, we might be out and promenade, you know, and coffees and all sorts of things. Anyway, so she's walking down to that area and she notices that she's not hearing anything because it should be quite loud. She's noticing she's not hearing anything. And then she's sort of been standing in the shadowy area and she's looking, comes upon this scene where everything is frozen. And I'm talking vehicles, cyclists, people walking, mouths moving while they're talking, just frozen in time. Everything. Probably birds in the air, I can't remember, but everything is just frozen. And she's come upon this scene. And she's looking at it, thinking, what am I looking at? You know, could you imagine if everything just stopped? You're the only person in the room. It does, like a movie. It does doesn't it? And but I, you know, and you're thinking, what the heck's going on? And if you'd heard, um, I know in Suzanne Henson's book, she spoke at our meeting a few meetings ago. Uh, but in her book, she also talks about an experience like that too. But but just very short. So she's looking at this scene, and she sees. A, like something like a, a spaceship. She says it's a spaceship. It's hanging over, there's a, some sort of an inlet which goes into a river or something like that. Uh, and there's a bridge and she's looking over there and above the water and beside the bridge there she sees there's a window in it and she can see two faces in it and what she can tell is they're like an inverted triangular shape. Okay. And the next thing she knows, oh, and then she steps out of the shadowy area, uh, I don't know why, and the, underneath the UFO, it starts to sparkle and twist, and then it takes off. And, and not until it's out of sight does it, everything actually switch back on again. And as it does, of course, suddenly there's all this sound of things that are happening. And she got another fright, like, oh! And, and then she ran over to someone and she said, uh, did you see that? Did you see that? And the man who she talked to, no one saw anything because they were frozen, right? Now, they weren't aware of anything having happened. Just like if I'm talking to Lauren here, you know, or all of us are in this room, we would not have a clue as to any 
anything interacting with us. We wouldn't have a clue. That case changed my perspective about the UFO phenomenon. Because I suddenly thought, what could be going on? I mean, you don't just have to hide and cloak. You can just distort time. Create a time bubble. We've heard of those through the 90s too. But create a time bubble where you go and do all this stuff, but it's like a fraction of a, a nanosecond between, and none of us would be ever the wiser. So a question comes up from that. Why do we see them in the skies? Why do we see extraterrestrials? When obviously, some of them, we don't have to. They don't have to show themselves. What's really going on? This case highlighted for me that we're still trying to understand extraterrestrial interactions or non-human interactions still with our human mind. We're still thinking ground traces, um, you know, even uh, missing time, for example. Mm -hmm. This, we don't, there's no missing time. You know, you don't have to have that for something to be happening. Mm -hmm. Think about that. Another thing I noticed in the 90s, I was reading the literature here and there, but there were a handful of cases of people seeing fetus, being on board a craft, seeing um, fetus, human fetuses, or what look like human fetuses, and or um, extraterrestrial, I guess you call them, hybrid fetuses in these glass jars, in liquid, some of them in vats, <coughs> or animals, and animal parts in, in glass jars, in liquid too. And we came across this case, and this gentleman, and I'm calling Bill, he spoke at a conference we had in uh, 2001. And uh, his experience, he was from Melbourne, and he, he, it happened in 1956, or it happened throughout his childhood. But he was a child of eight at the time living in Melbourne. And he said he was having experiences where he would walk through the very solid back door of the family home that was closed at the time into the backyard. Um, at the time, he thought this was an ET contrivance. But later, he came, he thought it was actually his own abilities being used, but manipulated by extraterrestrials. I don't know about that, but that was his perspective. He was then taken to a metallic grey light room with curved walls and ceiling and a pipe poked out of the wall through which brown gas was released. And he was told that this was to kill bacteria. We've heard this in a few cases, and um, I think Street talked about it, and um, a few others that I read. And during his, his experiences, he'd be taken to a waiting room and sit with others who seemed to be paralysed. And the grey aliens would perform terrifying experiments on people and tell them they were friends, but Bill said he knew that they weren't. And he was taken on board the craft at least 20 times that he could remember anyway. And each time would be for about one to two hours he'd be on there. So he'd have these missing experiences from his home experiences. And at one time he decided to, let's get getting out of here, even as a kid, I'm going to escape this. I'm not going to put up with this anymore. And he started running in a muck in the hopes of appearing stupid and fooling these ETs that he really wasn't anyone to be concerned about he was just a child who was freaking out basically, <laughs> which he probably was anyway. Anyway, um, so he started, he did that and he ran into a room where he saw a large tube full with blue liquid and what appeared to be humanoid fetuses with missing limbs floating in the liquid. And he saw humanoid beings that had been cloned and also human women who were being forced to place these mutants to their breasts to bond. And we've heard a lot of those stories through the 90s as well. Another experience that Bill had began when he looked out of his window and he saw a ship with a blue light emanating from it. And he saw a blue being standing beckoning him to come out of the house. And after four or five times, he finally walked out and went into the ship. And here he met beings that he described as the blues. Uh, and they were, he said they were full of love and they were non-violent. Now he had 20 to 30 of these experiences with the blue, where he'd be, take, blues, he'd be taken to classrooms where characters like hieroglyphs were on the um, classroom board. And he was taught about the earth, which the blues referred to as Urantia. We do have the Urantia book. Anyone got a copy of that? No, no. 
big, thick book like this, tiny, tiny book, yeah, written on paper. It's like the Bible, it's so thick, so thick. Um, anyway, um, and when he asked the inevitable question, why me, he was told that he was not the only one. And the Blues called him brother and took him through the spaceship, showed him how it worked. And in the middle of what appeared to be the control room, there was a pink crystal that looked like rose quartz. And the crystal was being used by the beings who focused on it with their mind to navigate the ship. So generally the Blues had concerns about the Earth, about what we were doing to the planet at the time. And this is a very common element that comes up with people who have close encounters. They have a deep ecological concern for the planet. I don't know why, they just do. Whether that's actually being instigated by outside sources or whether it's part of the integration of their experiences, I can't. Another case was a woman in 2002, she called me. She was a worried mother about her young daughter who was seeing little beings coming in the window during the night, and uh, four or five at a time. And uh, these aliens had baby animals in glass tubes filled with blue water on their craft mummy. So when I heard that, that was 2002, when I heard that, actually, I heard either of these stories. You know, I probably would have hung up on them <laughs> though many, that, that many years ago, but now I know differently because um, I've heard various stories like that and they are in some of the books, particularly David Jacobs, I think, is one of them, but there's a few others as well. These days there tends to be um, people reporting, uh, there's more people reporting positive experiences, positive contact experiences. But during the 90s, we've heard a lot of these abduction experiences which people were treated badly and they were seeing some terrible things on supposed craft. Excuse me, Cheryl. Was there any consistent difference between the abduction with the grows where they were doing experiments compared to other experiences that still have? Um, in, um, not really. No, um, although that one I told you about the senior police officer before, um, he did say that he was actually uh, on, on the craft and he was being shown around um, by one of those beings. Now he also had positive and negative experiences, a lot of people did, but they tended to report the negative experiences because they were having difficulty coping because there was nowhere, there was no sort of emotional climate established at that time for, that was receptive of those experience, of the more positive ones. Um, so what they were hearing was the abduction reports. And that was, that was probably, you know, that was why. Because every time, like in the 50s and 60s, we had the positive contact. In the, um, for me, in the, in the 90s, we had these negative sort of, terrifying abduction experiences. Then in the 2000s we had a lot of mixed motive cases where there were both types of experiences and now we hear mainly these positive experiences you know, where people feel uplifted from it, almost like a near death experience. In 2003 um, I received another report of a similar encounter of these um, things that were seen in glass jars and in liquid. Now this time the report came from a woman who I'll call Francine, who had a series of strange events during her life. They started over 30 years ago when she began to have, well this was, mind you remember, this is 2003, so add time onto that for the 12 years. But um, she had, ex had experiences from 40 odd years ago where she began to have strange dreams and as well as other bizarre experiences. And one night in her late teens, she went to bed and began to dream that she'd been taken on board an alien craft and was being led along by someone um, holding her hand. She couldn't see who it was, but they were leading her along a walkway and there seemed to be many of these in rooms, each above the other like a, a multi-level prison. Right, you know, you see those? But on the wall were containers that were approximately two feet tall 
and holding fluid and containing what she thought were unborn human fetuses. She didn't understand, but she felt that she was being shown these unborn babies for a reason, which was a whole new perspective on the mothership, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. no. She described the craft as being immense with many levels of these walkways, and as she was guided around the ship, she could see what she described as little people, about three feet tall, um, but she couldn't see their faces. And they were standing in front of panels of knobs, seemed to be flying the ship. And she felt like the ship was a, a mother craft in the literal sense of the word. But the babies didn't belong to these aliens. Instead, they were travelling from world to world, introducing these babies to other populations. Now, she said that she had, she had that particular uh, dream which she'd never forgotten. Um, and, you know, then I sort of put it on the shelf for them because it was a dream. It's a highly complicated dream. Um, but these days, understanding a bit more about communication between ourselves and non-human intelligences, I, you know, I, I um, take it on board a lot more easily. <clears throat> so, it was, um, it was very interesting. She also had another strange experience. I'll tell you this one. Um, just look, trying to see the time. The most unusual experience she recall was when she was working in a large shopping centre. And one day she was busy at work serving customers when she saw a woman who seemed to have a certain air about her. And Francine described her as seeming to glide along among the busy shoppers. And the woman came to Francine's desk and as she got closer, her attention was drawn to the woman's eyes. And Francine described the irises of her eyes as very grey in colour. The extraordinary thing about her eyes was that the pupils were elongated like a cat from top to bottom. And, at that state, and those sort of reports are quite rare, but they do happen, I mean, for our organisation, right? but they do, they do happen from time to time. And at that stage, Francine thought to herself, what planet are you from? But she couldn't keep her own eyes off the other woman's eyes and seemed to be drawn looking at them. And she remembered, Francine remembered the woman that asked her a question, but she couldn't remember what the question was. And she went on to describe the strange woman as having unstyled hair just at her ears, very straight and mousy brown in colour. She wore a, jet, a dress that just seemed to hang on her, and a cardigan done up with the top button. She also carried an old-fashioned handbag over her arm. And Francine looked at the woman and thought her dress seemed to be very out of step with current fashions, being more suited to her grandmother's day. Again, she thought that the woman was from another planet, and with that thought, the strange woman seemed to respond to it as well. She quickly moved off and disappeared out of Francine's view. Um, you know, the, people who report close encounters or strange dreams and being on craft, but particularly you know, having these interactions, they have a lot of unusual other things going on. And sometimes you go, what is that? What are we talking about here? You know, and I'm sure some of you have experiences like that too. Um, high strangeness. High strangeness, yes. And a lot of people put that down to just one of those things. And we down at Paracon recently, we heard Dr. Tony Jinks, um, he said that a phrase was coined for those sort of things in the 1930s, I think it was, called jottles. Just one of those things. So sort of all this um, acronym for it. But just one of those things isn't what happen. These things happen and there's got to be an explanation. Well, there may not be an explanation that we understand, but there is one that we may grow into the understanding of. I hope that happens one day. <laughs> one day. Just bringing in the Australian Aboriginal people and their understanding of close encounters too, because we are talking about Australian <laughs> close encounters of Australian kind. Um, so we've got these three tribes that are up in this area of um, Australia, that are up there, the Wanjana tribes. And we now we all know the story of the Wanjana and um, the um, spirit beings that are seen by, um, be depicted by Australian Aboriginal people on cave walls. And they have this, you know, they have this sort of halo effect around them. They have the, the large eyes and nose and generally no mouth. Uh, oh, I thought this. I just found this today. Actually, this is the um, I think it's the Aztec one of the Aztec gods. But it's also got this. 
sort of thing around here too, Viracocha. There were three that I can remember, Viracocha, Quisicom, and Kapukan, all from the, the Mesoamerican area. Um, but we won't go into that because I just don't have time. Um, but here we have the Wanjana serpents. And again, you know, you've got the, the halo effect around them. But here, down here we have a depiction of an alien by a 34-year-old mother and her daughter who saw the same thing. Just an interesting thing that um, I think you need to pay attention to. Because um, also, if you look at the, we've often discussed this, haven't we, about the, um, the boomerang shape as well. And we have these reports with craft that are boomerang shape. There's one here that's drawn with lights on each end. And Barry and I have actually had a little discussion about that and which came first, the, 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 the object in the sky that was boomerang shape and the yeah. Aboriginal people <laughs> In, well, that's, an, that's interesting. Let's yeah. have that. Yeah. Or you know, did they did they just um, come up with that on their own? Which they could have, of course. Um, but then we've got um, Kenneth Arnold's uh, a depiction of that, of the, what he saw at the time. And I was just reading recently. I I was under the impression that he only saw a few of these, but actually he saw a string of them, which were. Now, correct me, he was either one mile or five miles long. And just in the sky, just, you know, it's like they were scooping over the water. So he, didn't see, he saw quite a few. Again, it's sort of like a boomerang shape. I don't know, we have stealth technology. It's not boomerang, but it's certainly triangular. We had a lot of those reports in the 90s. So you've got to look, wonder about the connections between the aerodynamics of what we're creating and then perhaps of what Aboriginal people may have seen tens of thousands of years ago. You know, I wonder if there is a connection. This is Eric Sather, who actually did the study in central Queensland. I'll just tell you a little bit about what he came across. Um, <clears throat> he, was, he stayed there for three years. Um, where are we? 1996 to 1999. Uh, and in that area where he was, in central Australia, there were 750 Aboriginal people and they were located 500 kilometres from any population. And um, they called themselves the Walpiri people and, and they asserted that UFOs were spaceships piloted by extraterrestrials. Now these are the Aboriginal people there. Uh, the aliens were thought to search for and procure water from the desert too. And that was the study that he did. Because he counted to the beliefs of the remote Australian Aboriginal community. And in um, this book here, The Gossip Files by Nora McGee and Brian Dickerson, we have reports of these, uh, this sort of round, globy object that was seen sucking water up out of the uh, rivers around there, the lakes. Lake, Lake Tuggera was one of them. So if you have your hands on that book, grab it because it's hard to get this. The Aboriginal people told Safe that, that while the aliens never harmed them, UFOs uh, could abduct white people. And Safe himself was warned of this danger on a number of occasions. Although non-Aboriginal people recounted anecdotes of UFO sightings, they never circulated tales of alien abductions. Uh, instead, it was the Walpiri residents who re related these stories. Sathie goes on to say, when I asked why non-Aboriginal people were invariably the victims of abductions, I was told that the aliens were able to recognise Aboriginal people as belonging in the area. They were aware of um, lights in the sky, craft, um, siphoning water off from their water holes. And remember, Aboriginal people, to them, they're paying particular attention to their water holes because they need that. They need to, they rely on that. So they're watching, you know, they're aware of what's going on. Now, recently we had Evan and Stephen Strong speak in Brisbane about this great book, Ancient Aliens in Australia. And they carefully laid out um, evidence um, that we actually came from the Pleiades, that there were beings who came down from there, um, they interacted with the Aboriginal people, I can't quite remember now. <laughs> Um, and then from 
from there, all of humanity went out from Australia, not um, what we're taught that they actually came out of Africa. But they, if you ever get to see them, they do a very good presentation on that. We know that close encounter experiences report telepathy, but they also report, report out-of-body experiences, poltergeist activity, seeing ghostly apparitions, having bizarre dreams and visions, uh, precognition, they have near-death experiences, they can channel strange languages, um, they remote view, they can have mystical meditations, all sorts of things. These are some of the examples of what people who have close encounters report. Bring it about. Now, this is where I'm going to take a left turn because I don't know if any of you have read this book, The Amoeba Project. Near Happy? Anybody? Yes, no? Near Happy. Yeah, I don't remember much about it. Yeah, near so <laughs> Yes. Near death experiences, you have got encounters in the mind at large. And Dr. Green actually did a study of 6,000 people because he came from the field of near death experiences. Okay? He's been a near death experience researcher for, since early, early days, I think it was the 70s, maybe even late 60s. And so he was one of the pioneering researchers of that field. And let me just back that up a little bit because. For the 10 years before I got involved in UFO research in 1988, I too um, keenly studied the near-death experiences. So when I entered the UFO field and started going out um, doing investigations, I was primed to pick up when people would say, oh, you know, I'd say to them, oh, tell me what happened, blah, blah, blah. And then they say, Oh, and um, did I have any other strange experiences? Well, not UFO type, but I did have a near death experience. Or I did have an out of body experience, blah, blah, blah. And I can't tell you the amount of times that people told me they had also had a near death experience. And I estimate, I didn't keep numbers, but I estimated after a few years that about half the people that I spoke to um, who'd had close encounters and or who'd had very close sightings had also had a near-death experience. And I think you're going to hear a lot more about that connection over the coming decade. <clears throat> you're probably going to hear about it a little bit from Mary Rodwell if you go to the Nexus conference, because they've been, um, she's involved with the organisation Free, and they've been doing a, um, a research study on that very subject, not just about near-death experiences, but the relationship between close encounters and these other types of experiences, paranormal experiences that people have. This is um, PMH at Water. Now she also came from the field of near-death experiences. Again, one of the early pioneers in the field. But she found that adult near-death experiences, based on 3,000 people, 20% identified as being from another planet. 9% claimed to have been abducted by a UFO. Child near death experience is based on children, 27 people. 39% identified with being from another dimension. 14% claimed to have been abducted by a UFO. And 9% identified with being from another planet. Now, this year, uh, Barry and I went, in January went down to Sydney to the first Afterlife Explorers Conference. Australian Afterlife Explorers Conference. There's another one on in January next year. And we heard from Peter Smith, I believe, who's also talking at the Nexus Conference, that they have found an increase in people that they were doing life between life regressions with that were coming from other planets. And so I'm thinking, in my mind, Tick, what's going on here? <laughs> you know. But um, you know, I'm already aware many years ago that there was a connection between people who were having UFO events and near-death experiences. Uh, but at that stage, I was going, well, that's interesting, that's interesting. But then I sort of got hijacked by the abduction phenomenon and I sort of went off in that direction for a while. So we've got a, a, a long-term research of picking up these people uh, in the near-death experience fields being somehow connected to having UFO experiences starting to work the other way around. Skull, I think it's over in Scotland. It's a group of, it was a group, but they're doing other things now, but it's a group of four or five or six sitters who would come into a room 
and they would, um, they had this box that they could lock and they would put a film in there, lock it up, they would sit there and they would meditate uh, for a certain amount of at time and then after that the film would be developed and on the film would be writing, uh, images of people, uh, some who could be tracked down. Uh, some of the writing was so old that you would have to, some of it was hieroglyphic, but you would have to actually be a specifically studying that to, to know what it was. You know, some of that information that was appearing on the film, some of the film was like 20 feet long, that there was this writing, continuous writing on the back. But they also found this thing that they called blue. Okay. Um, and you've got to wonder, what on earth is that? What are we looking at here that was being developed on the film? Now, with this group of sitters, they had scientists there who were keeping a very close eye on what was going on. They would bring their own film and they would unwrap it and they would put it in the box that would then be locked and then they'd all sit there and the scientists would be watching what was going on. The, the film was never, never tampered with. Okay, so this is being developed. So here we have perhaps Perhaps some sort of communication from somewhere else or something else. Now, here's another book I want to bring to your attention to. I don't know if anyone's read this one. Anybody? Anybody? No. Nope. Okay. This is a story of Jack Lord, written by Rosemary Clem, an Australian. He also lives in Sydney now, I think. But he, many years ago, he was escaping from a communist country and he was shot and he went into a coma. And he had a near-death experience. Now you know what I'm going to say. Hey? When he had a near-death experience, he left his body and went to a spaceship on the bottom of the Atlantic and Pacific Ocean. And the book is about his experiences there. So I'm starting to think people are out of their body. Okay, that's you know we're starting to accept that sort of stuff. It's some sort of ability that we have, we haven't developed it yet, but it seems to be um, real because scientists have been studying now um, near-death experiences for quite a while. So we've got to wonder, when we're in these, when we're accessing these other realms, we're starting to see, or there we know, that there are other beings that share those realms with us. There can be other human beings, and there may be what we call God, I don't know, but there could also be some extraterrestrials as well, who, or some non-human intelligence that is not from here. Now, let's get back to the UFO literature, but guess what? Betty Andreasen, I don't know if you've read The Watchers, um, <clears throat> this was a, there was a series of books by her called uh, The Andreasen Affair, um, there's another one called, I think it's The Andreasen Legacy, but she had a series of close encounters through her uh, early years. And at age 13, she had an abduction in 1950. There's a whole lot of stuff you can read about in the story, but relative to what I'm saying is that she was, when she was 12, these beings came to her and they said, to, they were checking her out and she heard them say, no, she's not ready yet, wait another year, and then they're gone. The next year they come back uh, oh, sorry, at that time they said, you will meet the one, but you're not ready yet. The next year they come back and they grab her and they take her. And now Betty's also had near-death experiences, out-of-body experiences, close encounters. But in one of those um, close encounters, she's taken on board a craft. She's told by these little beings who are leading her along like this, that they're going to take her to meet the one. So they take her up to this area of this room and she enters it and it's full of white light and the light is a loving light and if any of you have read anything about near-death experiences you'll recognize if you read that part that it's the exact description of what people see when they have a near-death experience or when they experience it so i'm starting to think what's going on what's going on here in um, a couple of months ago, we had a gentleman called Lee Heather who spoke at our Brisbane meeting. And he came and he spoke about remote viewing. 
But while he was talking, he went off on a tangent a little bit, but he did tell us that, during that time, that um, they had tried to remote, remote view God. Now he was with Courtney Brown's group, he was over there doing remote viewing with them. And for those people who don't know, everyone knows what remote viewing mm -hmm. is, and your mind out to places, to coordinates and picking up information. They couldn't pick up anything when they were trying to remote view God, but they could pick up stuff when they were remote viewing the afterlife. And what he said were these beings, they were meeting people after they died, and they were sending them off to wherever they had to go away. Now one more story I want to tell you was back in 1995 I opened a, a New Age Centre in um, Brisbane, extreme Brisbane, Western suburbs. And I held a near-death experience night one night. And a woman came along and she told me this story. She wasn't there, she wasn't interested in UFOs or anything. She told me this story where she had a young child that died. And after the funeral she, she came home, she was so distraught she laid down on a bed and she could feel her heart rate was just sort of slowing, slowing, slowing. But the next thing she knows, she's out of the body. She described it as having a near-death experience. And she's out of her body. She's walking with the soul of her young child along this sort of um, path like this. She gets to the point, the typical point, where there's, she meets a spirit being. She can't go any further. The spirit being says to her, but I can take the child. Hands the child over to the spirit being. She says her love and goodbyes, then she walks back along the path. While she's walking back along the path in this non-physical state, she sees a UFO. She enters the ship, she's laid down on a table, has some sort of examination, like in an abduction experience, not quite clear what the examination was. But after the examination, she's allowed to get up, walks out of the spaceship, the next thing she knows, she wakes up on a bed. I've never heard another case like that, ever. And that was in the mid-90s. <clears throat> Always stay in the back of my mind. Again, I'm thinking, what's going on? Obviously, we're, having, we're able to have interaction with these beings in our non-physical state. When we die, and we have near-death experiences. Is it um, God that we're seeing? Or is it the one? Is it an extraterrestrial? Are these spirit beings actually extraterrestrials? Now, I don't know if any of you remember or ever heard of Val Valerian? Yes. yes, yes. Going back to a long time ago anyway, 60s maybe. But he was actually, I forget his real name, he was actually a CIA agent. <clears throat> and he said at the time that um, when we die and we go and we meet these spirit beings, that they are extraterrestrials. They are not, they are not um, angels or those sorts of spirit beings. And he said, and they will guide you to the light and they will decide whether you will re they can re they can reincarnate you or not. Because remember, we've got these are advanced beings who can create clones, exchange and take the conscious consciousness out of one body and put it into another. And if you want to hear a lot of stories about that, pick up Joe Lewell's book, um, The God Hypothesis, and he talks about a lot of those cases in there. So for me, this connection has always been there under our noses all along, but we just haven't sort of, because people, researchers are so, this is UFOs, this is the afterlife, this is our body, whatever, and we don't sort of cross-pollinate our research, but we really have to. We have to take an eclectic approach to solving the close encounter enigma, if you like. Otherwise, we'll, never, we'll just stay where we are, we'll never, we'll never find an answer. So I just wanted to finish with Albert Einstein's quote, who said, if we knew what we were doing, <laughs> it wouldn't be called research, would it? Yeah. So that's where we're at. We don't really know. Again, this is, you know, from where I sit, um, my perspective is that I've heard for a long time that people are saying, 
you know, come on UFO research or come on UFO community or whatever. You know, we've got to, we're looking for the next step in our understanding. We've sort of, sort of sat with it for a decade or so, right? Um, and I think this might be this connection to this other part of ourself that can exist in a non-physical form, which is consciousness. This is what we're talking about, consciousness. Um, we've got to start looking into those fields to be able to understand close encounters a whole lot better. Because there's a whole lot of strange things goes on with our consciousness. When you have stories like people who say they've had an abduction experience, but they're just sitting there in a, in a, a trance state, not moving, while other people are watching them. But they're not having the, the abduction experience in their physical body. They're being, the consciousness is being removed and taken somewhere else. Not in all cases. There are people who actually physically disappear and witnesses can verify that. But in some of these cases too, people are taken out of their bodies. That's really it for me because the end is the beginning here for me that I can see. Where, where um, it's funny, you know, when you've been in a field for so many decades, you see the evolution of how we perceive uh, people's experiences and they report different things that too, and at various times there are different emotional climates that are more receptive to strange things, you know, than other times. So I would like to encourage all of you, if you've had experiences to, obviously you'll do it here with Christie's group, uh, but talk about your experiences because this is, this is our real experience. Um, you know, it may not happen in our physical reality, but if you're an Indigenous person, there's no difference between physical and non-physical. It's all your experience, okay? So I think that's our time. So thank you so much.